The following is a conversation with Tim Farr from Rainier, Washington. Tim has a very busy schedule with work and family and gives you his tips and tricks on how to stay at the top of the race sheet, even though you're busy. I really appreciate Tim's time, and I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Thank you. All right, Tim Farr, Farr Racing Pigeons. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, no worries, man. Appreciate you having me on. It's uh, and a happy Independence Day. Yeah, happy Independence Day. Uh, for those who don't know, you're up in Washington. What part of Washington? I'm, I'm in western Washington. So uh, probably most people know Seattle. So I'm probably about an hour 15 south of uh, Seattle. Down, there's a little town uh, called Rainier. Not, not Mount Rainier, the actual town. So can you um, see Mount Rainier from where you are? Uh, if I go out uh, to the end of my property, yeah, I can see on a nice clear day. I can I can see very near. Um, but yeah, most uh, just about anywhere in Washington on a nice day, you can see it if you get a little bit of elevation. Obviously, we got a lot of trees here, but yeah, for the most part, uh, it's it's a uh, it's definitely an icon. You know. Yeah, I have family in Seattle area, so when I go, oh, do you? Yeah, when I go there, I love to to see that and. Next time I go, I told my cousin that I'd love to go and, and get closer and explore a little bit. I haven't been all the way there, but yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. I've actually climbed up. Uh, we didn't summit, but we got up to Camp Mir, uh, and they actually stopped us due to some uh, the, the climbers ahead of us. The boulder fell on them, so they had to get oh, back wow. out. So they, they shut the route down, so we ended up coming back down the next day. But uh, I yeah, so I, I still want to summit. What's that? What time of year were you doing that? Uh, that was, uh, shoot, it was late spring when we did it. Um, but man, my memory, it's been six, seven years since, yeah. since I went out. So, um, now with my kids, I just try to do, I mean, eventually it'd be cool to do with my boys, but, uh, just do backpacking trips. I don't want to burn them out and have, cause it's, it's no joke going, no, you know, no. going through that. So yeah, you have to be prepared uh, for that. Some preparation, yeah, yeah. training, all that. Well, yeah. we, uh, I'm jealous that you're sitting outside here in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I'm at. It's 100 degrees every day <laughs> for the past couple of weeks. I think we're finally going to get a break early next week, maybe get in the 80s, which will be nice. But uh, you're sitting outside. We have your lofts in the background, right? Yeah, you can see. Uh, I think it's like, it's small for me. But the one with the aviaries, that's my breeding loft. And then the, uh, this one over here, that's my race loft with the Sputniks on it. And they're... I don't know if you can see, but they're open loft. They're pretty much out at all times. I don't really lock them down until we get close to the actual race when I get them on a on a schedule, feeding schedule. But yeah, they're out pretty much all day. Um, just doing, which is most people can't do this or or don't think they should do it. But I I've been doing it for the last few years, and I I think it's awesome. But for my for my work schedule, it's it's been amazing because they stay generally fit lean you know and then i i can start working them out as as we get closer to racing but i even this is the first year i've actually tried to do it all season and they're open loft um every day up until i'll do uh, one toss usually on a thursday we basket friday so they'll get like a you know like a 45 on thursday and that just tunes them up and they're locked down friday for basketing and that's kind of been my my uh schedule this year and i've been <laughs> They basically get all the food they want, but they're burning so many calories. I mean, these cocks, they're all cocks. I only fly celibate cocks. And they're, I mean, they're outside. As you know, everybody that's flown widowhood cocks, they're tearing up the sky, mm -hmm. you know, out there, uh, you know, when they're in form. And the celibate cocks pretty much do that all week. And they're out just <laughs> probably looking for a hen or, you know, whatever. But I don't ever show hens or anything. They're just flying purely because they love this place, you know. Yeah. And for those who don't know, you've been in the army for an entire lifetime, entire career, right? How many years now? Twenty plus, right? No, I'm I'm at seventeen. Seventeen. So okay. yeah, I'm, I'm nearing twenty, which yeah. I'll I'll be looking at retirement. But yeah, it's it's been you know I, I joined a couple of years out of high school, uh, and I've been yeah I've been doing it ever since. Uh, spent most of my career here in Washington, outside of training, you know, pipelines back east and stuff like that. But yeah, I've I've been uh pretty pretty blessed to have a, a career that gives me some kind of control over where i'm at and most guys in the military can't really do this because they're moving every few years you know and 
I've I've pretty much had pigeons since like two years in, and I've had them. Now I've not been competitive like I am now, but you know I've I've had them. You know. Yeah, and I think one of the things, uh, you know, I've talked to Jeff Lusk, messaged me, uh, Ken Crater, and I've talked about you, and you have a very unique perspective because of your career and how busy you are, and also having a family. Your style with your pigeons. I think is going to be important for certain people to see that who are also busy and can learn from what you've done. And we're going to get into that. But before we do, how did it, how did you get started with racing pigeons, homing pigeons? What what uh, happened to get you started in it? And, um, you know, I know you're busy. Was there a period of time where you had them and then had to kind of uh, get back into it later with your schedule? How did you get started? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in Southern California down in uh, Santa Ana. And I still remember this day, uh, neighbor kid, we were about, we were in elementary school. Uh, he invited me over to his house. We, you know, we used to be a mix ride and stuff together. And we, so we rode over to his house and he just invited me into his backyard one day. And I go back there and his dad has lost more lofts than I have. And they're just lying in the backyard. And I'm like, and I see him, they're full of pigeons. And I'm just like, what, you know, just what are these, you know? And, and, you know, I'm, I'm super interested, but then he, he explains their homing pit, you know, they race them. And he points to a mountain off in the dis. I don't remember what mountain it was, but he was like, yeah, we, yesterday we were over there. It was like 90 miles away. We let the birds go and they, you know, they all came home. And I was like, as soon as he said that, it just was like, it just blew my mind. I just, I, I, I honestly couldn't stop thinking about them. I went home that night, told my dad about it. Um, went to the lot, you know, back in the day, I don't even, yeah, libraries are still a thing, but I mean, most <laughs> kids nowadays are, you know, they don't actually have to go look for the books. So right. I was, you know, I was going into the pet, the dog section. I was, I mean, I was combing every shelf looking for anything on pigeons, you know. And I, I always, you know, as best I could, I'd check out the books and I'd read as much as I could. At that time, um, my dad wouldn't let me get them. He wanted to make sure I was invested and really wanted them. So I, th I think it was probably about a year, maybe two years before I, I actually got on like I wrote a report in elementary school on homing pigeons like I was just like I'm I'm kind of obsessive about everything anything I get into and it's I've been that way since I was young so uh, it was no different with with the pigeons I mean really it's been kind of my passion for a long time but yeah so I was just like I, I just thought about it all the time and finally we uh, we actually uh, there was a period my dad and I moved in with my grandparents my grandpa had pigeons when he was younger you know, back in the day, most people had some experience. It's not like today where people have no idea what, you know, right. pigeon is. back then yeah. almost everybody had them. So my grandpa had him when he was young. So he immediately like kind of, and he's, he's into woodworking. So he and my dad helped me build this. Uh, it was, it was almost like a rabbit hutch. Right. And uh, so we built that, you know, we went down to, they had, you know, pet shops essentially that had pigeons in them. They were more like a feed store, I guess. Um, and that's, we went down there and picked out, I don't remember, I mean, maybe it was five bucks a bird or something. I bought some rollers. So we brought them home, put them in the, put them in the loft, a little hutch. And, you know, I got impatient. I was like, a few days went by and I let them loose and they, you know, they were gone. You know, they didn't, they, they didn't stick around. We didn't really have a good yard for it today. The second story and the hutch was kind of on the side yard. So birds didn't have good visibility of, of it, but, um, so they were gone. And then, uh, basically, I got in touch with, um, let's see, it was the, um, who was it? Uh, oh, uh, Jed's. So I, I, I spent, you know, Jed's wasn't too far away. So I went to Jed's and one of the guys there invited me to go to, uh, it was a one loss. So back in the day, there was the city of hope. Uh, it was a, a late hatch race. So Huck Reese ran the race and he basically, the birds that were left over in that race, um you know he would he'd give away or whatever so he gave me a pair and that was my first pair of of racing pigeons um so i brought them home and i kept them inside a little bit longer but you know still impatient i really want to have those birds flying right so i think i had them in for maybe a few you know it might have been a month or two and i i let them out the cock well actually they both took off they were gone so i you know here we go again right well a week later the hen comes back Oh, wow. And, it, you know, she must have flown all the way back to the race and wasn't allowed in or, or, you know, whatever. She came all the way back. And I think it was probably, it had to have been maybe 60 to 80 miles away from, you know, where we were at. And she comes back and there she is sitting on the wall right above the hut. She didn't know how to get in because I, didn't, you know, I didn't trap train them or settle them or anything. So she, all she knew was just generally what the uh, yard looked like. 
And so we, at night we netted her and we got her back in and that was my only bird for a long time. And I would, so she was settled at that point. So I would take her, uh, ride my bike around the neighborhood and I'd let her go and I'd race her back. <laughs> and I did that for probably a year or so. And so that was my first venture into, you know, homing pigeons or racing pigeons. And, um, she, I, I had her for a long time. I can still picture what she looks like and everything, but, um, you know, uh, eventually we moved, we got our own place and my dad helped me build a loft. I don't remember how it might've been eight by 12 or something like that. We got into it, but you know, you're young and like you go, you get distracted with life and things happen. So I kind of got out of it for a while. Then right around, if I'm going, you can stop me if you want to go back, but uh, basically I hit uh, high school age. And I met Rick Barker, who lives in uh, the San Diego area. So we, we moved out to Marietta. I was living with my mom, actually, at this point. We were in HOA, so I couldn't have couldn't have birds in our yard or anything. But I met um, Rick Barker, and he was in the VIP club in, in uh, Marietta, Temecula area. And anyways, he introduced me to a man named Al Forthall, who was in his 80s. You know, he's older, started having Alzheimer's and everything. But he had beautiful lofts, great setup. He was a really well-known flyer. He just couldn't really take care of his birds anymore. And I'm in, I'm a senior in high school. And Rick basically went over there and proposed to Al and Helene that I become their loft manager, essentially. So, you know, I, I spent two years basically flying with him. And I would go, basically I'd work. Uh, I graduated high school. I'd work nights. I'd get off in the morning. And I'd go take care of the birds first thing. I usually take a nap while my birds are flying or whatever. Get my my pigeon chores done go home sleep and then i mean i was i was like i was in it you know but i yeah. i didn't really i wasn't competitive i just didn't i just didn't know what i was doing back then you know uh but rick rick you know was definitely back then was like a mentor to me you know um and he's he does he doesn't fly locally anymore but he's a uh good one law flyer absolutely um, and uh so anyway so that's kind of how i progressed in so then i hit about uh shoot i was 20 i turned 21 in basic training but i joined at 20 you know the military once you leave you, you, you're you so busy with training and everything so i you know i had rick basically took all my birds that i had left at that point and then i went off to the military and you know i thought about them all the time and i wanted to get back into them but i didn't i couldn't really get back into them until, until i was in maybe two and a half years i got married we got a little place built a loft and yeah so i've been kind of you know i've moved them whatever until we got here i've really not been have in in my career too the timelines and everything. i was way busier i was i was going i mean i have five deployments in afghanistan so i was in and out of country like you know we would go combat deployment come back train go back and, and that was my cycle early on so it just it wasn't conducive for for racing you know right but i had them you know yeah. i had them. my wife was super understanding she knew it was my thing so she helped take care of them she was pregnant out there taking care of my birds like you know in hindsight probably not the best thing for me to be doing but uh i probably should have done kept it real small but i just you know you know how it is like, yeah i do for sure you can't give them up so no. um so anyway so that's kind of where and then you know we went back east for a while i still kept man i got some crazy stories driving birds cross country like because i couldn't just get rid of them i had to I had to bring, bring it with me, you know, like I, I, I'll tell a funny story. So, uh, I, I, I literally drove, I had a brand new 2012, uh, Subaru. And uh, I was like, how am I going to transport these things cross country? Cause I got a moving truck. We're moving all our household goods and everything. And I, and I'm moving everything myself and it's hot, you know, it's middle of summer. So I'm like, I came up with this brilliant idea to put my birds and crates in my Subaru on a car trailer on the back with the windows down and drive cross country and you know in my mind it's like yeah this is not bad the first stop i realized how big of a mistake yeah uh, we're good to go okay so yeah so we're driving cross country and i first stop i go and look at the birds make sure everything's good and you know the amount of dust that birds create you know pigeons create with the bloom uh it looked like a fire extinguisher went off in the back and i was like at that point I was like, I've already made this decision. So I continued the drive all the way. It took me about four days to drive from Washington back to uh, North Carolina. But um, yeah, so I just rolled with it. But anyways, just, just the funny things you do to try to keep pigeons and, and uh, 
and I, I mean, probably nobody else that's ever done anything that stupid, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we, but I figured, you know, if I put them in the back of the moving truck, they're going to die. Right. Yeah, heat, exactly. Two heat and two all that. Flat, so, yeah. and I, I, back then I, I honestly didn't know much about shipping birds or anything. So it hadn't even crossed my mind, but I mean, even the cost to, to ship the birds back then would have been crazy. You know, I had yeah. probably at least, at least 30 birds, you know? So, yeah. Um, so anyways, just funny things you do on your. Oh yeah. Uh, do you, you do know. you still have those pigeons, same bloodlines, same pigeons that you did back then? Is it changed? Uh, I, I don't have the same ones. I, I, you know, unfortunately I was kind of careless during those periods too, because I, I, again, I didn't, I wasn't as serious as I am now. And, uh, but I do have birds related, uh, through Rick. Um, cause Rick's basically since, since I left, I've always gotten bloodlines from him. Right. So I have birds that are related to ones that were doing pretty good for me back then. But I mean, <clears throat> I wasn't that competitive really. I just didn't have the time. I had the pigeons. I loved it. I wanted to compete no matter what, if I could, but I just, I just didn't have the time. And that's, I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of people's situation. Right. Right. Um, and, and now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a situation where I've, I've figured out a system that works for me. I still, I'm still gone, you know, last year, I think I was gone collectively on the six months. Um, maybe not, I was probably about four months last year, but the year before it was like six months. So <clears throat> I'm not doing any of the straight six monthers anymore, but it's more intermittent trips, but, um, still like, you know, that's to leave your pigeons for a month, um, and not have a solid loft system a way to keep them healthy i mean a lot can change in in a month you can come back Absolutely. and you know, sick and and dying you know so i've i've literally had years where i was gone for months come back and a month later you know i, I immediately get them right back into assist you know training and i'm and i'm racing within a month and a half um most people are spending you know every day building them and building trying to get to that point you know to have a team to compete but um yeah it's just i've learned to adapt to my circumstances and and find systems and i've flown a few different systems and really the celibacy systems i love i love flying hens uh but the cocks to me are, are just for my life are so easy like they're they're not in their laying eggs around they're you know, they're always, they want to get outside and, and, and fly. So they keep themselves pretty fit, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, exactly. I'm kind of, you know, in a way I'm, I'm wasting, you could say I'm wasting hens, but I try my best when they're young to, to send the, the hens out, whether it's new guys, a friend who flies them for me or one, you know, one lofts. Um, so I'm not wasting all of them, but you, you know, it's not a hundred percent when you're sexing them at a young age. No, it's so, sometimes a challenge. Yeah. So I'll end up with hens in there and if, if they're really nice, I'll, put them aside and put them in my breeding loft, you know, a spare section. I don't really have extra room, but I'll try to hold on to them, maybe donate them to a fundraiser or whatever. But um, I'm not keeping a whole bunch of extra hens because I don't, I don't even show I'm this cock, these cocks this year. I've never seen that. They, 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 just, they come home to the loft. That's their, their territory. They love it. And, and that's it. And I, I always thought you needed, they need to come home to that. And I'm this year, I'm, I'm, I've, my best cock last year i did show hens to the older cocks and there was a few extra in there he never had a hen he was the best cock in the team never even cared about a hen really all he cared was about was his row of boxes that he had so he kind of opened my eyes to to that right and um so I, I, this year i i just went i think it might hurt you a little bit on the short early races you know because those widowhood cocks you can get them i mean that's why they're using sprint racing so much right you can get them you know, you, you put them, put them down on a round of babies, get them in, uh, you know, dropping their flights into that early form, get them motivated with the system. They know the system. I mean, they're, they're gonna be hard to beat on a short race. Cause right. they're gonna come out the moment that that trailer opens, they're already leaving. You know, these widowhead co or excuse me, the celibate cocks, their, their head's not in the game as much early on, but the later races are the ones that really matter, you know, and that's when they, they just, keep building and building and building. I think the widowhood cocks can get stale as the season goes on. And these guys are just getting better and better and better and better as the season goes on. So right. you, you sacrifice a little bit. It just really depends what you're, you know, what you're after. But for me, I, I you know, if I, if I could win more, I still wouldn't change because 
with my life. This is awesome. You know, this works. Um, let's let's yeah. dive into that because you, like I said earlier, you're a busy man, working, family, and everything. When did you develop this system? You got to this location, and obviously, this is where you started uh, working towards being more competitive. Where, how did you kind of figure out your system of open loft flying, just flying one sex, and you know, here, so you know, uh, in Europe, in Belgium, they can practice many distances they they can decide to fly just sprint they can be specialized in middle distance some of them like the long long distance in the mm -hmm. usa we're unique to where we're flying from 100 miles up to 600 miles in most cases so mm -hmm. you really have to have birds that can do an all distance type of program as well so um yeah how did how did you des develop your system to work for you and and what was some of the trial and error with that yeah so it started, I used to have a tiny little loft. It was probably a four by six, maybe over. It's, it's gone now, but I, it was just kind of an experiment. I had, I had some late hatch babies um, and, and I didn't want to add them to the team. And I threw them over in this little loft. And I also, uh, my son had, he, he's got a little loft. He had trapped in uh, some, uh, a feral. So I, I, I threw the feral out there as well. And they, you know, they, uh, in time they paired up, but eventually, I mean, I had probably three or four babies out there in the feral and they just opened law. I left the thing. I didn't even go in that loft. I mean, they were, they were as close to feral as you could imagine. I had the food and water on the, it had a landing board and I fed and watered them outside. So I, I, I didn't go inside. I didn't clean nothing. I just kind of was like, I'm just going to see what happens. Um, so I left them in there. I lost one to a hawk. The rest all survived and they looked when I finally got a hold of them, I was like, man, I couldn't believe the condition they were in just because they're outside all the time. I mean, rain or shine, they were outside, you know. Now, they were they were so wild because, I mean, I I'd spent no time with them in that loft. So, unfortunately, one of the he's one of my best breeding cocks in there. He's he's ridiculously wild because he, he grew up on that system, right? right. But he's like the, the pioneer for me for trying that system out. And I, actually, I also watched a video – Yell, uh, Yelly Yelma, I think that's how you say his name. Mm -hmm. Um, and he he uh was showing how he open lofted his birds, and he's got a pond. And I still remember he's got the pond off in the distance, and the birds are hanging out of the pond and drinking the water and, and just picking at the sand or whatever. And I'm like, man, that's kind. Of, and, and so he talked about how he he open loft all day, and then he would flag him at night. So so I just kind of got my <clears throat> the the wheels turning on on trying the system out. And then seeing if it would work here. I mean, we have the falcon pressure that we have in, in Western Washington. I think <clears throat> very few places are probably, sorry, I had a drink, um, the same level of, uh, of, of the same amount of predators that we have here. Yeah, we have to deal with cooper so, hawks here, but uh, the falcons uh, are a different type of a predator for sure. Yeah, we have so many trees, hills, mountains, water. It's just, it's a natural environment for, for falcons. So, Actually, I should I should go back. So, what made me start thinking about the open loft system was uh, essentially if if I did the normal kick my birds up in the morning for thirty minutes to an hour, kick them up at night thirty minutes to an hour. The falcons I have a nesting pair just to my north, and they'd always come out of the north. <clears throat> I think they're right up on the river, um, and 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 they, this pair would show up, and they'd hit me almost every day. I mean, it was like clockwork. I lost three birds in one day to to this pair. They grabbed two, each of them grabbed one in the morning and then they came back and grabbed one at night. So I was like, I was like, man, I, this is devastating to be able, you know, the Falcons are Cooper's Hawks. I mean, when you got trees and they can sneak attack, that's one thing. And I know a lot of guys get, you know, have serious issues with Cooper's here. It's not as much of an issue because I've taken down most of the trees on my property, but the Falcons are, I mean, there's almost not, nothing that matches them in the air. I mean, the way they dive the speed, um and and just mentally gets into the bird's heads so you, they get hit by a falcon enough they're gonna go sit in a tree and just wait they're not gonna fly you know as soon as a falcon shows up they immediately just starburst and they mm -hmm. they go everywhere right so it was it was getting to the point where i was like i don't even, i don't know if i could fly like this you know um so i i started just thinking about the open loft and again as i i tried this system with the the, the experimental system what i noticed was they're these i mean the birds are super and the fact that they're coming home from hundreds i mean we, we know they're super intelligent they're going to want to survive right so if that loft is open at all times they know when the predators are out and when they're not right 
And they're going to come out, and you'll see even now. You'll, they'll come out in that Sputnik, and you'll have the ones almost like the watchers. They'll come out, and they'll kind of look around, and they, they just, like, get a feel for what's going on outside. And as soon as they explode out, the rest of them comes, come, come right because they know the coast is clear, right? Right. And they'll do that all day. So what I'm, I'm thinking is like, I'm, if I'm, if I'm making these birds fly on my schedule, I'm, I'm putting them more at risk to a, to a predator when they, and, and naturally they would know, or at least try to avoid Yet You're going to lose some still, but, but they're smart enough to figure out when the predators are out and when they're not, you know, but Absolutely. if, if for my schedule it works best that I go outside and kick them up at six 30 and that's the time that the Falcons are out hunting, I'm just opening the buffet for the Falcons right so for me it became you know as i started thinking about the system is is these birds are i mean they want to be fit the good ones do the good ones want to go out and fly they're going to keep themselves fit because because they they just love to fly right so on this system they're going to go out as long as i'm not feeding them too heavy and 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 maybe uh or letting them nest where they they're really bonded and they only want to stay inside the loft they're going to want to go out and fly. So they're going to keep themselves fit, you know, and with the Hawks, the Hawks really, you know, I, I do have Cooper's Hawks here, but they just can't really sneak attack them like they can in, in, in other areas. But my thought process is I always give them two openings. So there's, there's two openings on the loft. So if for some reason, a Hawk decides to come in one, the birds are going to know, first of all, something's going to be up. The chickens are going to make a noise or whatever. So they're going to know something's in the area. So they're going to be on, on alert, right? So that hawk decides to come through, which I've never seen it happen. I have, I have cameras inside that loft. I've never seen a hawk try to go in that loft. It sounds crazy, but it's it's open all day. And even I've got livestock guardian dogs that take care of the raccoons that try to come on my property side. So when I'm in my settling period, I don't even close it at night. Right now I close it at night because I'm trying to control the temperature swings. Right. But but during settling, it's open. I don't even I don't even bother because they'll because they'll come out when the sun rises and it, you know, or if they want to, you know um so yes uh you know i just have to have a system that that encourages them to go out on their own and you could probably i don't know how well you can see but i mean there's birds out circling that yeah we can see them in the background every now and then they they cut across yeah and this is this is uh it's almost noon and we're actually going to have a heat spike this weekend so we're going to get into 90s and 100s it's probably mid 80s right now so you know a lot of guys would be out flying their birds i mean they're not out pushing hard flying an hour but they're flying you know, yeah. they're out, you know, moving around and, and, and not putting on a lot of body fat and keeping themselves, themselves fit. The races will help get them in the condition as the season goes on. But, um, so, so, so anyways, my, I, I've kind of evolved and, and, and how I got to this, I, I like, I really like the hens. I like celibate hens. I think hens, hens, you can get really strong team performances, better cocks are kind of a little bit more like individuals. Right. And sometimes their, their head's not fully in the game. Um, so I, I like, what I can do with hens, but I, I wouldn't fly hens until I retire. Um, it just, it, it just doesn't too much more. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't suit yeah. your schedule. And so when your birds are out law flying like this, I assume that they have water inside, they can go get a drink and then pop right back out when they feel good. Is there food waiting for them or is it something you do when there's, you get home? Yeah, no, there's always, so I've, I've learned with that as well is, is how you feed. So <laughs> if I get, cause I do, I still uh, try to, do light to heavy this year i've kind of changed a little bit with the cox and in some respects i do more of a heavy to light but if if i go too light with these cox i mean they're they're borderline feral right so they're they're not stupid they know they know that that barley they doesn't doesn't have a lot of calories isn't dense doesn't have a lot of protein to rebuild they're immediately going out to the fields and and then they're picking through whatever they can find whether it's insects they just know they know survival says I need something heavier to, to sustain myself. So they could fill their crop with barley. I could force them and they're still going to go out there and look for food. So what I've, what I do now is, is I, I do feed a little heavier than I used to in the past, just because I want them to be more concerned with flying, not with eating and survival, but with actually just going out and exploring and flying. So I, I do, I do more of like, a, um, you know, like your 12, uh, 14%, like the champion, uh, versus log champion i use that a lot um i do use jerry but even with jerry i've noticed because it doesn't have the peas uh if i feed them only jerry they'll 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 go out fielding as well uh so it's it's really interesting to see the way they think you know and and 
there can be food out there at all times, but they know it's not heavy enough and they know they want something a little bit heavier. So they go out looking for food. So, um, so yeah, so there's, there's generally food in the hopper at all times. I don't just fill it up and let them pick through and scatter. I, I, I basically feed them twice a day, but the food I feed them in the morning will last them most of the day till about a few hours before I'm going to feed them in the evening. And then I'll, you know, I'll put up, you know, and, and it's changing based on how many birds I have out there, but um, I'm just kind of watching and, and, and just not overfilling it. Cause I do want them to eat most of what's in it, you know, cause the Versalaga has got that, that pellet. I try not to put too much cocks. I think are more finicky with food than hens. So I try not to put too much on the feed. I put, if I'm going to do anything, it's through the water and they're moving around so much. They're, they're ne- never hesitant to, to drink the water. I'm not, right. But, um, so I don't put too much on the food, but I do want them to eat most of it. Cause I think it's a balanced, uh, diet, you know, and that pellet's got a lot of what's missing in the grain. Uh, so, so I, I encourage that, but I, I, I don't, I don't short them at all. Like they basically have, I mean, you can feed these, I could go out there. It's, it's kind of crazy. If I fed these cocks super high fats and everything like guys too early in the week, they're not, they're still not going to put on weight. Cause they're going to suddenly go out and fly even more around the house. So they just, they just burn off whatever they have, whatever they take in, they're, they're burning off. And it's more of just a natural, because in, in, in nature, you, you handle any wild pigeon or even predator, they don't, they don't feel heavy. They're always light. And I think nature says, Hey, I need to keep my weight down so I can move fast, you know? So, well, um, it, it's important too, for people to understand that your birds, the way that they're open loft, they're able to fly and exercise all day. They're going to burn more calories um, mm-hmm. you know, one of the popular systems that people do is the Frank McLaughlin system where it's a lot more barley. And one of the reasons Frank does that is he, in his system will, tr- will train them either fly, fly them or road train them Tuesday, Thursday. That means Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they're resting. Yeah. So in that scenario, if you feed them as much as you're feeding, they may put on weight because they're not getting quite as much exercise versus your system that works for your schedule they need those calories to replace what they're burning all day. Right. Yep. No, that's exactly right. And that, and that's something I learned. Cause I, I used to be uh, with my hens, especially the guy that fed super light all the time. And I was like, can't overfeed, make sure, you know, make sure that, that I'm, I'm keeping them light. Like I'm the one controlling their weight, not them, you know, but now it's, I've, I've had to learn that they're, they're not going, if I, if they're on the system and I'm trusting the open loft, these birds aren't going to get overweight, you know, um, they're they're going to keep themselves lean and fit and and ready to 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 fly to survive right if something comes they're like if i'm if i'm fat i'm i'm not going to outrun that falcon or that hawk right, you know so right. uh so I, yeah i don't worry about that too much anymore one, one thing i do i'm i'm slightly cuz i i'm very natural too i don't i don't um use any antibiotics i don't treat for canker but i use a lot of natural products like oregano uh if if it's the time of year that so I've got I'm surrounded by a cattle ranch here. If it's the time of year where there's a lot of mud pools out there and stuff, they love I mean they love that stuff. They'll go around and pick around in the mud. There's something in that mud they want. But I'm also paranoid that they're gonna go take a big swig of it, right? And pick up something that I don't want in them. So I I, I don't I don't treat them, but I also I'm kind of uh, I'm, I'm preventative. So I'll, I'll I'll put like oregano in the water or uh, I also use Blitzform that uh, iodine product. Yeah. I think any idea, I just, just it's convenient because it's already made up and I know it's, you know, the dose and everything's right for pigeons, but I'll, I, I use blitz form a lot purely for that. Like, and I I've noticed a difference, like, you know, yeah. it's, I use iodine when we're in the field and I'm, I've drank out of nasty ponds, you know, filled up my canteen and put tabs in there and to disinfect it. So I know it works. So I'm like, Hey, if, if they're out there drinking out of that pond, at least I know when they come back and drink, they're not getting a one spread through the rest of them but number two it's hopefully going to keep it from getting down deep into their gut you know and 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 causing other issues but i don't i don't worry about um you know a lot you canker at all it just i i think that especially in respiratory that's a big one everybody treats for respiratory i mean they're out in the air all day i mean they uh i think respiratory is or antibiotics in general are and often and i'm not trying to beat people up or, or a, uh, a crutch for poor management. Like whether you're overcrowding, a lot of guys, they got too many birds in their loft. They're stressed. Loft's not perfect ventilation wise. 
So they have to run them on antibiotics to, to deal with that because they've created the situation that's not natural and that, 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 uh, they induced, you know what I mean? Um, whether in, and canker is another one. And, and I think it's another like drinking out of a, a bullet drinker is kind of unnatural. If you think about it, the things sitting there, they're backwashing like horses. They keep spitting into this thing and all that bacteria is getting warm and, they're creating a cesspool in there and then we, you know, continually drinking that and passing it around. So the canker is going to grow, you know, more uh, fluidly in that, in that environment. So if, you know, I do try to tr change my drinkers twice a day and I alternate them. I have one drying. So I, I do, it's not like I'm, you know, inducing things that will cause canker or whatever. I'm trying to prevent that, but I'm also don't want to clean them out. I want, I want to be able to identify the birds that, that are not able to handle that stress or you know whatever and i i truly i i just uh you know i i get a few every year mostly i'll be honest i bring in other guys birds and i i kind of have this mindset about go ugly early like i want to expose my birds to as much as possible way before the season goes so i last year or this year i had birds from 13 different breeders out there and i mix them in there i don't treat them or anything and they're just all being exposed to each other I don't even vac. This sounds crazy, I know, but I don't even vaccinate these birds till right before racing. So I, I just, I'm not going to vaccinate a bunch of birds that I'm going to lose towards, you know, into racing. So I hit them, I, I I hit them and I boost them right before racing, and that's that way they're protected. You know, I'm protecting other people. I'm protecting myself during the season, but before that, I'm not. I'm not even concerned about it. It's it's just never. It, now I, I vaccinate when I send them out to one lofts, but I'm not. Right. I'm not worrying about it here. Right. Um, it it all works itself out, you know, and I've, you know, knock on wood, I'm maybe it might seem like I'm playing with fire, but I, I feel pretty confident. Like I vaccinated my breeders. So they're getting some of that immunity from, from the parents. Right. Um, so anyways, I, I, I want them getting exposed to all that stuff early on. And then that when racing rolls around, man, they've been exposed to everything. <laughs> like they, and, and this sounds crazy. I don't even worm until right before the season and they're down on the ground every single day pick i mean i know in this this year i wormed right before and i remember in one section i actually had it was right below road perches i could i could see the worms in there but the rest of them were totally fine and they might have worms that i can't see but they're not like spaghetti like being overloaded by parasites right like in nature you're not getting worms so it's going to work itself that the strong are going to develop antibodies even for even for worms you know uh the racing cycle is pretty quick sometimes so I, I do it just because they don't have that enduring time to to build the exposure right um so i'll hit them right before racing with with wormer but that's pretty much it for for treatment wise um and uh the the uh blitz form product i also use that um it's a ron freed product right yeah, yeah, it's it's awesome. Um, yeah, I remember I it too for people. It's good, and iodine in general. My partner Garrett in Colorado is a veterinarian, and he turned me on to iodine early on, and and I've been using it for a long time. The only time you have to be careful, from what I've heard from guys that use the Ron Fried uh, Blitz Swarm, is that uh, if it's really hot, it can be a, somewhat of a problem. I don't know if you've experienced that or not, but. No, I, I do based on how much they're going to drink. I'll do, you know, it's all kind of by feel. I don't have, I don't have an algorithm, but uh, if, if it, it is hot, I just lower the dose. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there's days towards yeah. the end of the week where they have so much you can even, or so little that you can't even tell it's in the water, but I just yeah. put, I just put a little bit in there just because I feel like if they're open lofting, I want to have something in there. So the water is not, you know, being contaminated by whatever they're picking up off the ground. Uh, but I'm not, again, I, I, especially this point, I'm not really that, I mean, they're, they're so strong. It's, they've been exposed to everything you can think of. So I, I mid season, I don't, I don't worry about um, too much health wise. Um, I don't, and I don't really since, so actually going back, I don't fly, we don't fly young birds here. So I'm on a one season. I might be jumping around, but we, we fly one season in my club. We, well, we let's, basically. Let's, yeah. Let's go into what your club is, how many people there are. And you say yeah. you only fly old birds. Let's get into that. How, and what distances are you flying? Mm -hmm. So we've got, um, oh, we're growing. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And we just gained, I mean, he hasn't joined the club, but I mean, he's going to be a member here soon. He's working on his loft last week. He just retired from the air force. He's super excited about it. But I mean, our, our club, I think, 
next year projected 15 to 16 flyers somewhere around there this year we had 11 um you know you know how it is you, you guy plans on flying but he ends up losing most of his team something something catastrophic happens or life happens right so you know but but based on the numbers right now i, I think we we're sitting probably at 15 16 flyers i'm really just counting the flyers we have other guys that are in the club and they're not really actively flying but um yeah we we've we've been doing a lot of um a social media promotion um so i don't remember how many years ago i started the facebook page um, cause I kind of wanted to have something cause I, I basically started Craigslist ad, but I wanted to have something that pointed cause everybody's on social media nowadays. Uh, I wanted to have, you know, this Craigslist ad is, you know, I get a lot of people asking me to buy birds, but I tell them this is not really why I have the ad up and it all details a, and this is what the sport's about. It's like talks about like children and nature. Cause Jim Jenner talks about nature deficit disorder and all. So I, I just like, it's kind of like, it's supposed to be like, almost like clickbait like you click and you're like wow what is this you know and then at the bottom it says check us out on facebook southwest washington racer so then it has something to point to and they can go on there and say like oh these are this is actually a thing it's not a joke these guys are releasing birds or doing whatever so it, it, it gives some substance to the to the ad you know before they even meet us uh and and so i think i tried to do a count the other day i think we have six guys in the club that either joined from craigslist or facebook that's great one of the other that they found us so Cause you know how it is like people will go on Craigslist and sometimes you don't even know what you're looking for. You're just kind of like, Oh, what are, what are people selling on Craigslist? You know? So they pull up the Craigslist ad. I put it in the farming garden section. Cause I'm like, Hey, if you're, if you're looking for farming garden stuff, you're probably capable of having pigeons. Cause if you're in the middle of the city, it's it, depending on your situation may not be really the right situation. But if you're, if you, if you can have a farm animal, you probably have a pigeon. Right. Um, so, so I put it in there and I mean, I get some crazy people interested but you have to be willing and patient to deal with that if you're the guy that gets frustrated and mad and 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 ang like you gotta you gotta be able to sift through those people like right. it just takes i mean i've had that thing up for years and i i've dealt with some like off the wall people that, that message me as you can imagine but if you if you do all that and you get one guy to me it's all worth it right oh yeah so yeah. So you, you just have to be willing and you got to go on there every two weeks. You got to refresh the ad and it's super easy. You know, I have, I have a bookmark for Craigslist and I go on there and just, as I remember, I go on and I refresh the ad and just, you got to be patient with it. And God, like, just like this sport, you got to treat it like this is, you're playing the long game. You know, you're not, you're not expecting those like to go do uh whether you're going and doing a release at the feed store or at an elementary school or whatever, you're not expecting all of a sudden you're going to gain five members because you did that. It's the one person that saw it and it just like stuck like me when I was a kid, I just thought about it, you know, or the adult even. And and they just, at some point they're like, yeah, this is right for me right now, you know, uh, and you're just waiting for that one person, you know? Yeah. And, and you just got to be patient. And I think that a lot of people don't have, they, they want, they expect to see immediate results. And that's not, that's not the game we're in, especially nowadays. Like there's so many other faster, more exciting things out there to do. For certain, you know, for certain people, it's we're in a faster time than we were 10, 20 years ago. Um, yeah. So you just got to wait, you got to wait for that one person to see it, you know. Yeah, it seems and, that way that it takes a certain person in a certain time in their life when they have the ability, time, money, all those things, because it's expensive to get into uh, to race, you know, competitively for sure. But to get people's interest to plant that seed, that's important for the future of the sport, for sure. People have to do those things to continue this for sure so that's a great way to go yeah. about it so what distances are you flying in your old bird season what do you start and what do you end with yeah sorry i totally ignored that <laughs> uh no so we start no, you're good. Uh, you're good. uh we we don't fly a terribly long schedule here i think um i mean we've got terrain and stuff but our, our furthest races for for me on the i am on the short end probably last year we we our iron bird race was 375 but it, I mean, it was tough. I mean, it was, the birds were 10 and a half hours. Um, I mean, unfortunately we had, we had some West winds. They went to the East side of the Cascades and, and, and our winners came out of the, the wrong direction on a, on a hot headwind day. So that's how far off course they had gone to work their way back. Uh, so we don't like the old days, they'd fly five sixes here, but they were flying them earlier in the season when it was cooler, you know? So they, 
now it's basically just a build up. So we'll start our first race for me will be like 75 miles. Um, I'm hoping next year we won't be as short, but 75 and then we'll work out the conk. We just had a 360 uh, two weekends ago. And that was our final concourse race. And then this coming weekend, we're having uh, our club started this race called the Iron Bird Race because we're trying to have something a little tougher. We're not trying to make it brutal, but we want to have something that's, you know, a good a good test. Because I, I personally believe I, I like warmer conditions, headwinds. Because I, 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 I just think that the, the real good birds, it gives them a total chance to, to show themselves. And I've I've had plenty of concourse winners here that won by – you know, good margins on a fast blow home day and never did a single thing ever again. But generally, if I get a bird that wins on a tough day, he's going to repeat. That That's what I've seen, especially if they show it to me in their first year. The next year, they're usually even better. Um, so I like I like those those those. T- and I, every course is different. Not everybody can because the prevailing winds and, and all that. But just for here, I, I really like the the longer races. So that's what I'm here to my system and everything that I'm doing is towards those later races. I can do well in the earlier ones, but the earlier one, as we all know, a loft location and everything has a lot, a lot to right. do with shorter, shorter races. So I like the races where it becomes more about pigeon and, and, and your system, uh, you know, not just location or, you know, winds or whatever. So, um, so anyway, so that's that's kind of what we're. I don't think we're ever going to go further than a four hundred here. I just don't see people, especially further, having a stomach the stomach for it. Not and not nothing against it. It's just I understand they're flying. You know, our, our extreme long end. We got guys up near Canada. They're like a hundred and like over a hundred miles past me on the long end. It's a totally different race, right? So, right. so I mean, it's it just you got you have to do you know, do the best you can, you know, with what you've got. Right. So I've just, accepted, and one lofts nowadays, or you're not going farther than 400 miles. So that type, that just to me is like, well, I'm, I'm selecting the same type of pigeon. You know, I'd love to go further. Cause I think as an old bird, especially they can really show themselves as a two and three year old going five, 600 miles. But if a yearling can go 350, 400 on a tough day, he's shown me a lot, you know, absolutely. And that's, that's kind of where just for me, I, I don't get, I'd love to go further, but I don't, I don't get wrapped around it too much, but yeah. So, our, so our, our furthest race and we fly about, um, I think we had seven weekends this year. It was nine races. Uh, we ended up having an additional, I hauled a race mid season cause, uh, the weather was bad for the extreme long end. So we ended up having a shorter, uh, it was 160 mile race. So we threw that in there and then iron bird. So we'll probably be at, t- uh, you know, close to 10 weeks of, uh, you know, of a season um and yeah so so our club basically we only fly uh bold birds so we basically that gives guys it i mean it's so freeing just for me like to not have to worry about breeding babies in the middle of winter uh i don't even use lights in my breeding lofts like uh i paired up in 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 may this year uh actually a little bit earlier this year it was end of april i think but normally may you know they're already wanting to mate up the lights you know, it's peaking in June. Right. So they, they want to breed. Right. So I don't use any lights. So I'm not, all my babies are sitting in cages. They'll get moved in on, on Sunday. Well, Ironbird, you know, race is going on. I'll move them into that loft and that's when settling begins. So I don't even start settling until race old bird racing is over. Right. So it's just a natural progression. So these birds and the predator pressure is so low during the summer, right. There's plenty of food and everything else. So it's, it's the most optimal time for us to be uh, a settling birds, you know, not having, you know, early spring and the Coopers are just hammering them, the Falcons there. I mean, it's, I still, they get exposed to it, but it's not, you know, too much. Um, So as soon as I throw them in there, that loft is just open and I just throw babies in there and I just check them, make sure they're drinking, but I don't go, there's no settling process. They watch the old birds that are in that loft go in and out and they like, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. And right. They follow them. They'll go out. They'll fly to the roof. And then they'll they'll be a little scared. They'll fly right back in. So they they learn all on their own. It's it's a totally natural system. Um, I don't do settling kit nothing. So um, anyway, so they'll settle all summer long. And this is this is me. But most guys are about on the same timeline, right? Uh, this year I didn't experiment. I didn't even train in the fall. So I left them on open loft all winter. And because guys will say they got to get trained as young birds. Well, I kind of like breaking 
barrier is like you can't do that well i'm gonna i'm gonna try to do it you know <laughs> so yeah, exactly so i i didn't train them at all in the fall they didn't have a single toss until their first toss was i think in in march and i went 15 miles in their first toss and they beat me home from 15 miles their second toss was 30 miles but they're just basically being they're going through the mold they they most of these birds out here don't even get through the wing mold because they're they're essentially are on a almost a natural darkening darkening system because I mean, the early ones they'll get almost all the way through but the later i mean i have some of my best birds out there didn't even throw a single flight the entire season uh, and they had baby flights they were flying on so you know if a guy wanted to though and he's like thinking hey i might have issues because the weather i got i got kind of lucky we, i had a lot of breaks in weather to get them out and, and get them down the road early spring sometimes they'll just get it'll just rain you know now you, you know how washington i'm sure you've yeah. heard yeah um so I get kind of lucky this year and it all just, you know, it all worked out, but uh, next year, I think I'll, or this coming uh, fall, I'll probably get them out like 40, 60 miles. And I go North cause my, I got terrain right here to my South and I've learned if I jump them into there, it gets crazy with the Falcons cause they'll fly back and forth trying to figure out how to get around the terrain. I don't want to deal with that early on, you know, until they're experienced. So I'll go, I'll actually go the opposite direction, 40, 60 miles. I do that every year and I uh, get them, get them to where they're experienced on the road and then I'll jump them 20 miles south. Um, and then usually they're strong enough and, and smart enough to figure out how to get home with the terrain that they got to deal with. Um, so it's, it's been super cause it just, there's no schedule. I, I just kind of start as, as my work allows, you know, and as I have time and um, the, the guys in our club, if you're single, like, and you got kids are doing soccer fall is when a lot of that stuff is going on, right. Sports and stuff. So not a lot of guys want to be out training young birds all summer during the nicest part of the year. You know, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm sure there's other guys out there that fly young birds. Maybe they love it, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work. Like during, during the nicest time of the year when I could be just throwing these things out there and going and enjoying my summer with my kids, you know, taking them backpacking or whatever. So, right. Um, you know, uh, so, so anyways, they, 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 they're open loft. Uh, actually, let me backtrack. So, so the guys in our club, we have one season, right? And I'm sure you've seen it. You'll have guys that'll like pick, they're like, ah, I'm going to fly young birds this year. Next year, I'm, I'm not going to fly old birds or, yeah, I've got a young bird team. I'm going to fly old birds, but I'm not going to fly young birds. So they, they can kind of pick and choose. Well, nowadays we need all of us to like get those birds down the road. And when you have a single season and you have a shared like motivation to fly that season, it builds more excitement for that one season. And most guys are more inclined to be involved because that's their only chance. Otherwise they got to wait a full another year before they race again. They can't just skip and like, ah, I'm going to yeah. fly, you know, right. in six months with, with young. So it's kind of, I've seen it where like there's that anticipate as soon as the season ends, everybody's like, we go back into the kind of the quiet period, we're settling and everything. But as like fall rolls around and it's, you don't have a lot going on. You just, you're thinking about racing coming in the spring. And it's just like, we're all thinking about that. And we're talking, we have a WhatsApp chat. We're always, you know, some of us, we're, we, we like to talk in there and maintain communication, but it just builds this, like it, it, this focus on one season, you know? And uh, so, yeah, we've, we've done other things to try to make it easier for guys that are working. We've got the live clocking and most guys like you probably on the benzing or, I think a yeah. lot of guys have gone to Benzing. We've got yeah. the top pigeon. So we, we were one of the first clubs to do that. And that's like the last thing I want to do. The club's 45 minutes away from me. So to drive, do that drive twice on a weekend, like I'm not going to fly pigeons very long doing right. that. Right. Yeah. To be honest, you know? Yeah. So for me to go out there and press knock, you know, close and upload. And then I'm the race secretary. So I go inside of my computer and I do the results right there in my, you know, in my living room. And then I send the results out to the WhatsApp chat. There's no, we're not killing trees, passing papers around or anything like that. It's like, you know, we're, we're, we're just, yeah, we're using what we have. The digital, we're in the digital age. Right. So it's just trying to help guys that are busy fly pigeons. Yeah. It makes I think total it, sense. the more clubs do that, the more interest they're going to get. Cause as soon as you, yeah, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it can yeah. be, be a lot. To, to, to tell these guys hey it's a it's an all-year thing <laughs> yeah yeah so, what, uh, um, what kind of pigeon do you think fits your system what characteristic traits are you looking for when you're handling pigeons deciding what you know you want to fly 
Yeah. Um, that's a hard one. Cause I, I, I mean, physically I don't, there's only a few things and I traveled around to a bunch of, you know, for, for work, I had the opportunity a couple of years or a few years ago to go visit a bunch of really, really great flyers and breeders around the country and, and handle them. And I, I like the only, the few things that I could, I could say, Hey, they all, they all shared was great feather quality, strong, strong vents. And I'm not even saying tight vents, just strong structure and vents uh, some kind of character, you know, a bird that, that, you know, whether he's looking around, moving around, um, things like that. Um, and that, that was, that was about it, to be honest. Like for me, you know, if a guy came and handled my birds, they, they might, they may found, find they're a little, they're a little deeper, a uh, little bit wider vents, a um, little bit longer. Um, I don't have birds full of muscle. Like I, I think that a little deep, and I know a lot of guys hate, deep pigeons but i think that it gives more attachment for those muscles you get a bird it'll stay a little bit leaner uh and isn't gonna you know blow up and store all that fat you know real densely in in the muscle tissue um and and then as far as like the type of bird i guess it would be i want a bird that by by a yearling i can fly you know i can push out 400 miles you know on a, on a, on a pretty tough race and i know a lot of guys i don't want to wait two three years to, to figure out what a bird now i not saying i won't fly in that long but i want them to show me something at least by you know in the first year of their life right so so they, they need to be earlier maturing you know in order to do that but i think a lot of like your your family is like your when people talk about speed birds or distance birds i think a lot of how early they come into form you know i think you'll see your your speed birds i was talking to somebody today actually about that i think your speed birds you'll see and even like if you believe it's tied to the molt in the wing, you know, whether them throwing the first flight um, you'll see, and I've seen it even out here because I've got so many different guys, birds, some of those, those, what we call speed birds, they're already on almost their third flight. And then I've got other birds that are like my distance type stuff. They haven't really done too much early in the season. They haven't even thrown a flight or they're just throwing their first flight, you know, and they're all in the same system, same lighting, same age, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different ages, but I'm, I'm just saying I'm comparing similar aged birds. And I think your, your distance birds, the more you work them, the longer the season goes on, they're, they're going to show their form later in the season. So I don't know if it's like necessarily a short versus distance type bird, but I want a bird that, you know, by the 400, they're going to, they're going to show me something. And some guys would probably call that a one hit wonder, but if he, if he, if he wins a race, eight and a half hours, nine hours on the wing in warm conditions, headwinds, dude he showed me almost <laughs> exactly all i need to see like a bad bird's not going to do that right like, i don't I, a bad bird doesn't hang on that long right like, he's, i agree he's he's holding on and he's pushing he just didn't early on he just was and you've seen it and i've had really great birds all season they come out of the wrong direction they just they just love to fly and they'll just overshoot the whole season they'll come they'll come right 10 minutes late out of the north but you know they're with the lead group but they're just, they're just pushing and they keep going, you know, and they're not, cause they're not on a widowhood system. So they're really not keyed up. Right. And then, uh, you know, two years ago, my bird that won the final race, uh, he didn't do anything. He was always 10, 15 minutes late out of the North final race. I think it was, uh, eight, it was over eight hours in the wing, warm conditions. It was in the 1200s. He won the race, you know, so, uh, in the concourse. So I just, I don't know. I know people talk about one hit wonders and I, I just think that it's a different type of bird. You know, if you want a bird that, that, you know, is, is hitting it hard all season, you better be really good at handling them because you're going to burn them out. First of all, if they're coming out right at the gate and winning all the short, fast races and in, in form, your form doesn't last that long, in my opinion. So you got you got a window that you, you know, I'd rather than peak in the middle of the season, you know, uh, sure. and, and finish out the season strong. So, so, I don't know if I answered your question, but a lot of the birds that I have are more of like, like I kind of had, I, I missed the, the boat. I know South Africa, the, the million dollar race went bad, but I kind of like a bird like that. Like the, the, the tough South Africa type, type pigeon. Um, I say South Africa, we have tough pigeons here, but I just, the, the international type race. Uh, and that was such a big and prestigious race back in the day. So that, that was kind of in my mind, the type of pigeon that I wanted. And a lot, there's not a lot of races here in the United States, as far as one loft races go, they're like that. But I, 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 I enter the high desert over there in Idaho and the type of pigeon that'll fly that it's terrain from Nevada 
up to Idaho. It's usually warm. Uh, never tailwinds. They, they, they never have, they, they won't put them up on a tailwind, but it's eight to 10 hour race. And that's like exactly what I want. And then it's similar to here because we got terrain and the conditions end up being the same. So if, you could probably call me a specialist if you will, but that's like the type of bird I want. Like we'll even say six, uh, six to 10 hours with, with warm headwinds. Like that's kind of my, and yeah, I think you'd see that in Europe with the, the national races. A lot of them end up being similar to that, you know? Um, so that, that would be, but, but I want them to do it, but you know, as a yearling, you know, um, so the, <clears throat> you know, I've got Colossus type birds from Ken Easley out there. Um, the ironclad stuff, which is like a Colossus Koopman based type bird. And I've got Tyrant, my, my best breeding cock. He's a Huskin Van Real Jan Arden. So he's like distance stuff from Jeff Blythe. Um, <clears throat> and then Rick Barker, the Hoobins, the Hoobins are pretty fast too but they can usually push out to like a oh, 400 yeah. yeah you know so so i got i mean his i say that's probably what i've had the longest that's done the best for me overall you know but um you know i got other stuff out there that's that's done really good for me but those ones have been like consistently every year there's something good out of out of those those birds you know um so but those are all birds as you know that are pushing the the distance as a young bird and as a yearling you know um and uh yeah did that answer it did yeah that's exactly what i was wanting to know and you know jeff life loves long distance so that's definitely uh yeah. good yeah, he's, to have he's, as well yeah no he definitely i mean he's pushing some some races 700 miles so like the father and mother to my best cock from jeff both flew like the six and the 700 collectively, I think like six or seven times, which is pretty unreal. I mean, just the amount of environmental factors to overcome that many times on the, I mean, every time you send them, it's a risk, right? But to have a bird that just keeps coming and keeps coming may not be like winning every race, but they're, they're right there, you know, and that shows a lot to me. Um, so I, 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 I really had this like, idea of distance birds for a long time and i still have him i still have a little bit of jeff stuff but i think there's a balance like you can't go too far because you'll end up getting pluggers right right you'll get like for most most racing out there you'll end up having a bird that just you just don't race far enough for them to show themselves yeah, especially in the way exactly. we race here so so you need you know some speed or you know a faster maturing bird you know um so so i have more of that out there but i cross that and man it's when I cross it, especially with something that, that I think is a little bit faster. Um, it's usually awesome for me, you know, especially when I send them out. Yeah. It seems that way in one loss right now where a lot of the top guys are crossing in speed with some distance to create kind of that hybrid pigeon that yeah. is able to handle tough conditions, um, and handle some of the short races, um, uh, yeah, and it, it seems to be the trend for uh, what people are doing, not only one loss, but it seems to be working club flying as well, especially uh, when it's tough headwinds like you're talking about. And, you know, uh, Ken Crater in Louisiana has to deal with a lot of hot headwinds. We have uh, a mixture of weather here in Oklahoma that we have to deal with, with from heat to storms to, you know, winds. So yeah. you have to have a pigeon that can do it. And and to your point, our, our top pigeon, Cool Hand Luke, he's a 2009. He's still fertiling, still filling eggs, incredibly enough. Um, wow. He was great no matter the distance. Uh, he was incredible at 300 miles. Uh, he bred a, one of his sons was two times first 300 miles, but his best he was a first prize, 500 miles, two times first, 600 miles. We even sent him to a 700. That was a total disaster, and only two birds made it back to Oklahoma uh, after a week, and Cool and Luke was one of those. So wow. it's just one of those pigeons like you're talking about that when it gets hard, he shows up. And, uh, yeah. you know, a, a bird that can win a 100-mile race may not be able to do something like that. And uh, it's yeah. a different kind of pigeon, so. Yeah, I think I think there's a nerd like a bird like that's got strong I mean, to go down and deal with the stress of whether he's you know he's got to find water, find food, and all the different things to deal with that kind of stress takes takes a special bird, you know, and to have a bird that's fast and 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 can survive when he because let's be real, it's it's gonna ha at some point something a falcon's gonna hit them, something's gonna happen environmentally, they're gonna have to go down. Some of those birds 
they're so high strung and they give it all. Yeah. But man, when they go down, they're not getting back up. Yeah. Like they're, they're just toast and they're awesome for what, you know, for what guys want them for. But I think if you want the pigeon we're talking about, you have to have something in there that's, that's a little bit more clear headed and, and stronger constitution and all these things where they can, they can go down and they can figure out, Hey, all right, where am I? Okay. I got some water. We're good. Something's not trying to kill me. All right, let's get back home, you know, or what, what yeah. whatever it is. It's Cause like, not that we want to have every race be a survival race, but it's going to happen. And ultimately to win the final races, you need a bird that gets to the final races. So, uh, you know, sometimes if the conditions are perfect and you have these beautiful flat courses and nothing ever goes wrong, it's always a nice blow home. That pigeon's probably not going maybe not show up but if you're if you're on any course where they can potentially run into issues like you need something like that um so i i yeah anyways i'd I'd probably beat that up no i i think that's great and i think the united states is unique that way where you know you have to have the pigeons that can handle those scenarios because we can't go every week and fly 100 miles 60 to 100 miles we can't you you have to go with what the schedule uh, set up to be uh, for us we fly fall young birds and spring old birds and so you have to have pigeons that can handle young bird racing 100 to 300 and in, in old birds you have to have pigeons that can handle 100 to 600 and you know yeah there's certain pigeons that you can have that go towards certain distances the threes the fours but you also have to you know have those pigeons that can help you on the short distance you have to have those pigeons that can help you on the long distance and so uh, yeah. we have very well-rounded pigeons here. And I think, uh, you know, with the way that we do one lofts here as well as, qu- you know, quickly those birds get sent out fast, mm-hmm. you know, our finals are three fifty. some places they're 400 miles finals for young birds, which, you know, they don't do that overseas. So, uh, our birds have to mature quickly. They have to be versatile and they, they can't just be specialized into one thing. So I think that goes back to that point of breeding in to that make that kind of hybrid pigeon i'm seeing that more and more yeah no absolutely i think yeah i think it's i think the the speed i put i think there's plenty of speed or birds that specialize in europe in the shorter races that can go the distance but when you're breeding multiple generations they haven't proven they can so when you start pushing them i mean you got to test them right to see if they can but you know the distance birds can fly the distance so it's to me it's just some more of a natural progression to find birds that I know have gone the distance that, that just need to be a little bit faster. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so anyways, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I had this like, you know, I guess fancy of flying really long distance here and it's, it's really not, but, but I've just kind of evolved to now this is, I think this makes the most sense for me, you know? Absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, but as far as specializing, if, if you want to call me, but I get, I want, I, I just want that back to the, that, that pigeon between like even one loft. So I'm, if the, the one loft isn't like close to an eight hour final, I just don't, I mean, nothing, there's plenty of guys that like those races out there. I just, I'm not, I'm not that interested in it. Like, and I'm not trying to, like, I'm better. Than, I just, I want to find a type of bird that does that, you know? And if it, if, and I know those are rare, like, cause most races nowadays are like five, six hours in the wing, if that for a final. Uh, but, but I want that eight to nine hour bird, you know, for a final race. Cause I think there's enough time where a bird doesn't get lucky. I don't care what, what anybody says a bird that, that he may not do anything through that whole series, but he comes out front on a, on a nine hour race. Like he, he, he wasn't subpar. Like he, he had something in him. He just wasn't, you know, thinking, or, you know, the other thing is you don't even know what sometimes these one loss when they come home, are they flying around or they screw You know what I mean? Like, how do you know he wasn't flying extra 30 minutes, you know, cause he just felt good, you know? Yeah. And, and it's not like at home where you get them on a real strict routine. And I mean, those things are coming in like rockets because you condition them to do that. And one loft, they can only take care of them all the same. Right. So I don't think guys really think about that when you're looking at wind companion, all your only, the only thing, you know, is a bunch of numbers on a screen. You don't know the full story. So, I think, but there's, there's no denying what a bird does on the final. Right. To me in, in the right conditions, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, that's so, something, and, that's something I've encouraged a lot of the one loft guys I've talked to and a lot of the top one lofts do this now, but plenty of video updates, 
letting yeah. us know what's going on in the loft, trying to pick days that are going to be challenging, good working days. I think that needs to be the priority. Um, you know, I think some races have had issues with trying to get the race to be on a certain day when the people are going to be there. But, um, you know, I think we have to go more towards what's the best day for a good working race for the pigeons. And if it happens to be on the day of the party, great. But if not, it needs to be adjusted. And I think that's how we get to those types of races and finals that you're wanting. Uh, yeah. those challenging ones, you know, but there are some races that are doing really well with updates and everything to where it's, you're more involved and more part of it. And I think that helps a lot. It's definitely what I prefer. Cause you know, like you said, um, you don't just want it all to be numbers on a screen, looking at inventory lists. You want to see some what's going on. And, and there's definitely some lofts, one loss that do that now, but yeah. to get that type of race that you're talking about, I think it's going to have to be, uh, you know, the, the races have to be paying attention and, and select the right days for sure. Yeah, no, it's definitely tougher. And unfortunately, I think there was a period and, and maybe it's still going on, but guys were kind of competing with each other for higher return percentages. It's not like, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating going out there and just, you know, pushing it, like creating a survival scenario. But I think it, it causes guys to get a little nervous when there's, they see a little head, headwind in the forecast or whatever. And, like, ah, oh, man, I might drop 200 and this is going to affect my final return percentages when they're comparing me. Like at the end of the day, if you're an honest, you're a great race and you, you do a good job, you're doing the videos, like you're, you're saying, and all the, all the little things, people are going to support you, whether you, you know, you lose a few more birds than what some people would, would deem, you know, because the, the environment's out there. And, and if you're on certain courses, the, the course is hard, you know, like, the birds go the long way around a mountain pass, you know, and they come the long way home. Well, I mean, some of those birds aren't going to make it because they're not made to fly an extra two hours on the wing, you know? So stuff happens, you know? Um, right. But I just, I don't like seeing them all piling in like training tosses. Right. Final race, you know, so it just, to me, it's a lot of money. Like I spent enough money here flying at home, but to send my birds out and pay all that money, I'm really, I'm not into gambling. Like if I'm doing it, I feel like I'm testing my birds. You know, I'm not, I get enough satisfaction flying at home. Like I like one off races, but it's not my first love by any means. It's kind of a supplement to what I'm doing here. Yeah. So if I'm going to spend that kind of money to send them out, I want to know, I don't want to like get a year invested into that race and then and then the final race end on a total blow home five hours on the wing you know and just like what happened you know like it, all that for to end that way you know to me would be i'm yeah i'd be i'd be pretty disappointed yeah <laughs> so, for sure. makes total sense uh, so yeah so that's just the way i think and there's very few i know there's very few options out there like that but that's is what it is. So I'm, I guess I'm a specialist. <laughs> no, I think that's a great answer. And I, I, that's exactly what I was curious about. And, you know, everybody has their preferences and what they enjoy. You know, I, when I was, we were over there in Belgium, some guys hate waiting too long, you know, they want to get it done. Yeah. So they yeah, like the yeah. hard ones. Some get, people go to the club and start yeah. drinking. You know? Yeah. They want to, it's more social thing. Right. So yeah. it's, it's everybody has their difference and in, in what they like. Uh, but I agree with you. I like those type of birds that can, handle that three to 400 mile range and, and do it on a day when it's tough and uh, not quit. And, and certainly it takes a certain kind of mindset of a pigeon and um, selecting based on that, you're going to get the pigeons that can do it for sure. Um, yeah. One question I was just thinking of that I didn't ask you when we were talking about your care for your birds, do you use the Versalog or grit? Do you have grit available at all times? Do you use pick stone yeah. or anything like that? Uh, what do you have mineral? Yeah, waters? I do during the uh you know the the settling phase i'm not super I, I do put it in there i get the local the winner's cup grid you know it's got it's got uh sodium and, and and whatnot in there but i i throw that in there and then i use javadi i use um i do use the all-in-one from um uh, versalaga and i i try to i don't feed that stuff too much earlier in the week because it's got a lot of the vitamins, you know, and things like that. And I'm kind of the, like, so I'll like that the final few days, I'll give a little bit more of that with pink mineral and stuff to try to bring them into that better condition towards the end of the week. I don't want to, you know, when they get home, they, they have it, but then I don't, I don't refill it is what I'm saying until later in the week. Uh, and then when they get home, it's fresh. Um, but I don't pull grit when they get home either. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fresh out there pretty much every few days I'll dump it, you know, and, 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 
and put fresh. But but truly, like they're out during the time where they're on open loft, and they they don't eat grit that much because they're out picking out whatever they want. I don't do pick stone or anything anymore because they'll they'll go out and pick. Uh, you know, we've got molehills and stuff out here. They're out picking yep. it out of those. They, like they get what they know what they need. Yeah, you know, and and so I, I just don't I don't get wrapped around like you know and and shipping pick stone over here to get because they're gonna go find whatever it is they're picking it. I don't give greens anymore because they've got the grass. I mean, the grass is gonna be dead here in like a few weeks. But like uh, you know, for for much of the year that they could pick, especially early in the race season, it's nice and green out there, and they can pick whatever they want that they need, you know, so I, I don't supplement too much in, in, in that way, as far as grit and, you know, additional things outside of the food and, 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 you know, a few things I put in the water. I do put like amino acids and stuff in the water when they get home uh, and glucose, um, uh, Versalaga has their, I think it's glucose plus vitamins or whatever they get home, they get, they get that. And then I just get this cheap uh, livestock uh, amino acid and I, I add that in there. When they get home, and then I also put some oregano. And the oregano is all – whatever days the blitz form's not in there, they pretty much have oregano in the water. Um, and they get so used to it that I don't think they even – it doesn't even phase them. Even though the, they'll drink, they'll chug it, but then they'll come up and they're sneezing because that the oregano, you know. But I think it's helping keep their, their sinuses clear. And um, So, yeah, so that's – I'm big on the oregano. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. No, that's great. Um, what, uh, if, what's your advice to new guys? Like you said, you're, you're trying to grow the sport. So when you get somebody who's wanting to start out, they're new to the sport, what's your advice for them to get started here in 2024 to start the right way? What, what advice do you have for new flyers? Um, let me actually, you know what, real quick, when we're talking about clubs, I want to go back to something. Cause I think a lot of that, what we're going to lead into is going to have an influence on, on, on guys getting into the sport is your, is your club atmosphere, right? If a guy, if a new guy shows up at the club and, 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 and you know what I'm, there's, there's clubs out there that they, they all hate each other. They right. can't even, they can barely stay in. They all, they're, they're literally only together for logistics reasons because they have to ship their pigeons on the same, on the same truck, but they, they truly don't want to, in the old days, there would be multiple clubs because of personalities, but now it's like, we got, we all got to be together. If you're going to bring a new guy into that environment where you all can't, you hate each other's guts and expect it's going to be, it's going to foster like this feeling of camaraderie. And like, this is something because a lot of, I think pigeons are great. And, and I think a lot of guys like you and I, we love the pigeons. We're going to have them probably regardless, but some guys are getting in it because they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Right. Like if they, sh they walk into the club and they see like a unified, like, we're all like we're a club we're actually like we, we we like each other we hang out like we all have our differences but like we generally we get along and we can talk to each other and and have this thing the shared purpose you know and 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 fly pigeons together then then your new guys when they show up and they see that they're gonna suddenly they're gonna feel like they're 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 walking into something that's that's bigger than them and then yeah. it's going to motivate them to want to be a part of that right. right and and then when you get that new guy i mean you have to like you have to give till it hurts. Like truly, I mean, if it's not like the old days where you had just a surplus of people and all your best flyers, you had to like beg for their attention, you know, and 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 just like hope that he would give you a pigeon or or it's not. We're not in those days anymore. Like if you're the top flyer, if you're the best guy in your club, like you have to go out of your way because there's so many other competing interests out there for you guys. Like you you have to find that guy. And it, you may think, oh man, he's he's going to be a waste of time. But like, it's better you try, and and maybe waste some of your time, than do you for you to just blow him off and 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 lose a guy that potentially was a contributing member to your club. So so I think, you know, to go back to your point about new guys is like find a club like that, you know, and hope and uh, it's geographically that sometimes you might be limited. The only club in your area is a bunch of guys that. They're like I was describing, they don't like each other. Um, yeah. If you're that guy and you really want to do this, then maybe you start a new club and you find some guys that are like minded and you, you, you know, create a culture that is more inviting to people with families and to, like that want the whole thing, you know, not just show up, 
shit my birds in the trailer and leave and not even say a word to each other. So I think I, my opinion is like, we all talked about reasons sports dying. And I think that that has a lot to do with it is the club and guys just aren't invested. Like they just, they, they've been doing this so long. They've become kind of like cold to all the other, you know, social aspects and like, and, and, and <laughs> the other thing is guys don't like, if a new guy is motivated and he shows up and he starts beating them within two years, they went from friend to foe, you know, instead of like praising that, that that guy showed up, put the work in because ultimately you're not winning unless, unless you're putting the work in. Like nobody like just gets lucky week after week after week. Like you're putting the time in and that should be encouraged because ultimately we all want, and you, I'm sure you're the same way. I want better competition because then my breeding loft gets stronger because I'm competing against higher competition level. So ultimately the, the better it makes me have to be on my toes and it makes me have to ensure I'm breeding better pigeons to, to keep up with the rising competition. So I think, I think new guys that I think they should relish the challenge of, cause it is a challenge. Like, like when you come into this, you shouldn't expect things to just wins to get handed to you. So like, you gotta be prepared to work, you know, but work smart, you know, focus on pick, pick something specific, whether it's young birds, if you're in an area that's a bunch of strong young bird flyers, just focus on young birds. Don't worry about everything, you know, just do, you know, uh, get really good at one, one thing within this sport. Don't try to do it all. Cause guys will go out there and they'll spend all their money on every <laughs> don't buy birds. That's another thing. Do not buy birds. I right. tell like so many new guys. I think it's just, they think the bird has, you need good birds. There's, there's absolutely no doubt. But if, if, if my system isn't right and I don't know how to handle them, it doesn't matter how good your birds are, you know? So they're focusing, they're so focused on the bloodlines and all these having the best and the latest and greatest, but they're neglecting the lot that that loft out there is probably one of the most important things, like spend all your money, like go around and visit all the different lofts in your area. Cause we're, I mean, we're totally, we're the Pacific Northwest. What works for you in Oklahoma isn't going to work. What work? I mean, it, it might, but you need to figure out what works here. Right. You know? So, so that is the first thing, but before you even have a single pigeon is, build the the nicest most perfect loft based off what you're seeing in your area and then you could start adding you know birds into the mix but yeah it's all i think systems focus on systems not not birds early on because if if you have a good like if you have the club we're describing you're the guys in your club are going to set you up with their best you know i don't have i don't keep extra birds out there that that i breed for for new guys like they're getting the same birds and if they're not good enough to be in there, then, I mean, I, I call them like, they, I, so whatever I breed for new guys is coming right out of my breeding loft. So, and, and the other guys in my club are, are no different. So give them your best. Um, yeah. I kind of went all over, but hopefully I, no, I that's, answered. that's great advice. And I, I think uh, if, if, if someone's watching this and they're in a club that does have some issues, maybe some division, maybe try to be the light, be the one that brings everybody together uh yeah. to get that to create that culture because as you said it's important um to build up a culture that uh allows people to feel welcome to fly their pigeons and that's going to keep people around and you know we we can't be picky on that now with the sport the way it is we have to get people involved and want them to feel welcome and um if you have a new guy that you don't help and don't tell him anything and they just get their butts kicked for a couple seasons they may just drop out and as well so be, you know, if, if someone's watching this where their club may have some issues, be the light, be the one that kind of helps push forward on those ideas that you're talking about, because yeah. without that, our clubs are going to keep shrinking. Right. So. Yeah, no, I, I think you're totally right. I think a lot of the issues we're talking about, they're not I know, national issues. I think it's local is where you make the most influence, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, for, for, for the sport. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I know there's a lot of like politics, like focus on the lowest level possible and then work your way out from there. You know, don't right. start up here and, and think that you're going to suddenly change everything down here, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, do you have a proudest moment with racing? Because you've had a lot of success uh, over the years. And uh, do you have one that sticks out to you as your favorite accomplishment? No. 
and it can I, be more than one thing if it's tough to tough to choose of course but yeah i think um so i'll start so my first uh actually this will kind of tie in because glenn and my club we're, we're good friends and we've been flying together really since i've been here but uh years back i was in korea glenn basically bred my whole team before i left and um essentially I, I was gone for months came back to a team that he had bred for me he had some of my birds but it was you know it was a mixture of our birds and i didn't have a breeding loft at the time i didn't i didn't have the room so bred this team and my first concourse wins were off this team that was bred by my friend and so so that that was pretty cool that like to be able to have success early on because you know my friend helped me out and then also he and i just recently won the high desert race we had two birds on the drop together which was like that'll probably never happen again in our lives right so but to have two birds i think they were like 10 minutes out front or whatever um so that yeah that was pretty cool i don't i don't really dwell like i can't sit here and quote all my wins or anything because I'm, I'm honestly i'm not like like i can remember last week but like i'm not like five <laughs> weeks like right, right it just yeah. i'm i'm looking at the next race yeah like i'm not living i'm not living in the past five years ago and quoting all my and i'm that's fine if guys are, are, are like that and that's but right. i just like i'm like i won now i gotta win again you know and so that's just kind of my plus i you know i've, I've had enough tbis that i think i feel like it's starting to affect my memory because i can't remember certain things anymore and my wife i can barely remember my kids ages <laughs> so, that sounds bad but like uh it's just some of that stuff is like i'm just moving forward you know just keep one after the other like like race ended i gotta do this in order to win next weekend you know so i yeah. don't know that's just the way i think but that anyways that was pretty cool with glenn uh and then yeah. jeff uh, in fact you mentioned jeff lusk earlier he won iron bird last year you know it's not a huge race we had a hundred i think 100 birds or something like that last year and it was his first season ever flying he basically did everything that i you know i was mentoring him and everything and uh i mean he won the final race you know and with birds that he he got from me and i mean he bred them but they were they were my breeders because i loaned them to him and so he won the final race last year which is super cool i hope he wins it this week again he's uh that would be kind of crazy <laughs> so do you all basket this friday for that or is it thursday uh, saturday so normally we basket on a friday but we're trying to have this like event where it brings everybody together so it's like a barbecue and we got guys that are further north and it's quite a drive you know coming down on a on a on a friday night so uh, we meet at Glenn's house and we'll have a barbecue and kind of, uh, you know, ship the birds there. And then Jeff's going to, I hauled it last year with, with Alan in my club. And then this year, Jeff's going to haul it and we'll release them Monday. We, we end up shortening it, uh, because it's going to be like, uh, dipping into the hundreds this, this, this weekend. So it just, we didn't want to make it unfair. Right. So, sure. um, we, we pulled it back to two fifty. uh, he could realistically drive that at night, kick him up the next morning, but he's going to get him down there. He's got a, uh, a shop. He's going to keep him in, feed and water him. And I, I honestly, I hauled it last year. I think that, I think the liberation has a lot to do, with, especially those longer, harder races. You bump them down the road all night long. You show up at the release point 30 minutes before you're about to kick them up. They're all car sick. They didn't drink. You know, like all these other factors, they didn't even get to rest all night. They basically haven't slept since the day prior. And now you're going to expect them to fly the hardest race of their life. Right. So I think, I think the hauling, I kind of got off topic, but I think the hauling has a lot to do with your success on the harder races. Uh, so I think even some guys don't like their birds being in the basket for two nights, but I think if you load them appropriately, you don't overcrowd those crates and everything. And, and you feed them, you feed them appropriately and water them and you have a nice pool, like a good place to keep the birds. I think your success in that race is going to be even better. Those birds had a chance to rest, get oriented, <clears throat> and give their best the next day, you know, and it's, we ask a lot of these birds. So I think we should do everything possible to, um, and I know some areas they don't, they don't have a pigeon guy hauling their birds. So it's just some dude they found who doesn't even care about pigeons, you know, and he's not going to pay attention to all the little things when, when you get down there and ensuring birds are splashing the water around and, you know, all this, like you got a dominant bird blocking all the birds in the crates, kind of just poking him back. So the other one, the timid birds can come up and get a drink and all those little things that I think, and I, I see him doing in Europe. Like those guys are like professional. You watch them. Like they're, they're, they're treating those birds in that trailer. Like they're their own. That, at least the videos I've seen, maybe they're just staging them, but <laughs> that's the way, that's the way it looked to me. And, and those, sometimes those birds in the crates for like seven days. Yeah. Some of those, 
international races. So yeah, you don't, if you don't take care of them, they're not going to perform on those kind of, those kind of races. So um, I think the hauling is super important. Uh, for yeah, absolutely. The success of a race like this that we're trying to push next year. We're trying, so we're trying to motivate guys for the longer race for, for this race and try to, build more competition for the old bird series. So we're have we're our club's actually guaranteeing five thousand in prizes next year. So we're gonna oh, raise wow. money in the um our we have a we had a fun our first fundraiser this year and we bought aluminum crates. So our whole club has brand new aluminum crates. We actually were assembling them. So we had them shipped collapsed so that we could assemble them at the club to save shipping money. So we built all we have 40 of them. But so next year we're gonna raise money and put it towards the Iron Bird race to try to get guys because it because it's like you know how the seasons go. It starts dragging on. And guys, just, yeah, I get, I'm going to go do, you know, whatever, go camping or, and they just drop out because they don't want to fly the end of the season. But now it's like this race where the money is at, you know, and that motivates some people, you know? So anyway, so that'll be next year. Um, so it'll be kind of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. There's different ways to keep interest and get it, get excitement to grow. We have a yeah. traveling trophy in our club that's similar on a, on a 300, but uh, yeah. Is there anything that uh, you'd like to add that I haven't asked you? I've kept you here quite a while. It's the 4th of July. I'm sure you got family stuff going on today at some point, so I don't want to keep you too long. Is there anything I missed or haven't covered? Oh, I think we did a pretty good job going around the world. Um, yeah. No, I, I just I just appreciate what you're doing. I've watched pretty much every – so I, I've got like a 45-minute drive to work, you know, so I drive about over an hour every day. So your, your episodes, I can pretty much get one done, in, you know, in a day, so – uh yeah unfortunately the the first one you've done in a while is me and i'm not gonna watch that <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, yeah more more is on the way we're lining up new guests and getting people nice. uh interested i i went at such a rapid rapid uh pace there to start that uh oh dude you were going yeah. so i was like dude how do you even have free time because <laughs> yeah it was it was wild there for a while but uh definitely lining people back up and uh and excited about that and i appreciate you coming on and can't thank you enough for your service, uh, 17 years going towards 20. And, uh, you know, today, Independence Day, uh, we get to enjoy because of the men and women like you that go and do those things. So I appreciate it. I appreciate your time coming on. And uh, I think people who are busy like yourself are going to learn a lot from this. Um, if people want to contact you, you have a, a Facebook, dedicated Facebook page for your racing pigeons. Tell the people what that is. Yeah, I just recently made it. It's uh, it's far racing pigeons, so F A R R racing pigeons. So they, they can, can find they can reach out to me on it. Yeah, yeah, and I I made a YouTube and stuff, and I'm I'll probably start doing a little bit more of that. I'm just trying to create more content. It's obviously some of my stuff, but I think that it just puts a different spin. Like our club page, they can also if they want to see what our club's doing, just go to <clears throat> Southwest Washington Racers on Facebook too. And I mean, we have a lot of content on there, and it's pretty cool because. Jeff's like the real masker, so he'll he'll make little clips and stuff and, and post them up. So, um, but yeah, far racing pigeons. All right, Tim Farr, I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your fourth, and uh, we'll have to have you back on and and let get us an update on how things are going with the, your style of racing. It's it's unique, and I think a lot of people are gonna be happy to learn about it and hear it because uh, I think there's I think your strategy is more towards what the future needs to be for busy people that you know want to come in and still be able to enjoy the sport so i think it's been really educational and, and informative and i appreciate it yeah i appreciate you man it was good thank All you right.